Um, so my name is Sarah Milligan. I am with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. Uh, I am in Weatherford today uh, with Noreen Starr. Today's date is June 11th, 2018. We're doing an interview as a part of a series we've been doing with the Shalako Alumni Association, um, uh, focused specifically on military veterans related to uh, Shalako's uh, historical campus. I don't really know, always has to say it's not an actual place anymore. Anyway, uh, that's as formal as we're going to get. So, um, let's, I'd like to get a little bit of background information on you, just where are you from, um, sort of anything you want to talk about your family or any anything else to bring us up to date. Okay, uh, I was born in Clinton, Oklahoma, which is west of here, about 14 miles. Yeah. <clears throat> I was born at the Clinton Indian Hospital. Um... My father was in the Korean War. He was in, he was in the Navy. My, his brother was in the Vietnam War and the Korean War. And he was in the Army. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my grandmother's brother was uh, MIA for years. And they finally declared him killed in action. Um, during World War II. Mm -hmm. He was a fighter pilot. At the time, it was the Air Force that was still under the Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, we had a lot of people that were veterans. There's a lot of military service and it was talked about a lot in the home. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wanted to join the Army. So I did. So, um... Let's back up a second to, are, do you have a tribal affiliation? I'm Cheyenne. Okay. Um, and uh, you decided to join the Army, but it sounds like there were a couple of different branches of military that your family had been in up to mm -hmm. that point. So yeah. maybe talk a little bit about your choice for the Army and how you how you came to that. I, I started out in the, you know, you know, in the Guard, and I went regular Army is what happened. Mm -hmm. Because I really liked it, you know, I really liked it. And then, um, where did you end up joining the National Guard? Clinton. So it was while you were in Clinton. Mm -hmm. I never asked you this. What was your relationship with Shalako? Because that's where I met you. I went to school there. When did you go to school I went there? To, I went to high school there. I went to high school there in seventy five, seventy six, and seventy seven. Oh, you were at the tail end. No, yeah, I was a, uh, yeah. The very tail end, um, and half a year in 78. So I guess it was 76, 77, and half a year in 78. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, before we get into the military side, maybe maybe we'll talk a little bit about uh, how you ended up at Chilaco and maybe a little bit about your experience there. I was, um, I was a, a throwaway. You want to expand on that a little bit? Um, I was a child that nobody really wanted. Um, so did you have act like did you have parents who were actively raising you? No. Who were you living with then? Um, maternal grandparents, and it was pretty rough. They weren't mean to me. They were good to me. They just didn't know how to raise kids, mm -hmm. and they were like really, really old, you know, and my brother was with me, my younger brother. We had a lot of baggage, you know, from being abandoned, and mm -hmm. there was a lot of mental issues and stuff going on too, especially with my younger brother. And, uh, so it was really hard and difficult for them to deal with him and then deal with me and then me being in the middle and I always felt like I had to protect him and then but anyway I ended up getting sent off so it was kind of like I was just kind of a throwaway child and I ended up in the system mm -hmm. um, I was adopted several times I was in several foster homes um, I don't know how many schools I went to, so a lot, different schools. 
Was it always in the, within this area of the state? It was always in the state of Oklahoma. No, it was always in the state of Oklahoma. No, it was in the state of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but uh, Shalaka, I think, was one of the longest places I was at. So how did you end up there? Was that a choice or was that somewhere that you were, well, was that somewhere that you were sent? Well, it was, I didn't really have much choice. Mm -hmm. The last foster home that I was in was with a preacher and his wife in Drummond. And it was horrible. It was horrible. And I just couldn't, I couldn't live there. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, you know, you're old enough that you can go to an Indian boarding school if you want. And my case was suggested it, so they came up with the idea, so. And, you know, I mean, I've been to, you know, I've been to Whitaker, which was a children's home in Pryor. Mm -hmm. um, I'd already been to several different institutions like that, so. Mm -hmm. I was like, hey, this will be cool, because I been, I went to Concho whenever I was like 11. I was wondering about that, yeah, because yeah. you're so close to there. I went to Concho when I was a little girl. Did you like going, like, did in, in the institutions, institutional versions of that, did you like that when you were growing up? Or was there, I guess like isn't the word I'm looking for, but. Did yeah, it, I liked it. Was it okay? I liked it. I was kind of independent and I could do my own thing and I didn't have to worry about people bothering me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I did. Yeah. So um, your caseworker suggested that you go to an Indian boarding school. Um, was your caseworker Indian or was your caseworker not? White. Was that a Garfield County? Okay. So Shalako came up. And I read the material. I was like, oh, I think I want to go there because it looked like it had a really pretty campus. And I seen all the pretty trees. And I'm like, hey, I want to go there. So <laughs> that's where I went. <laughs> so you, I guess you, at that time, I think you put in an application and then basically usually got to yeah. accept it pretty easily. Yeah. Um, so whenever you got there, was it what you thought it was going to be? There was a lot of kids there. I was surprised. Kids like your age, or just, yeah, yeah. I was really surprised. I I didn't expect it to be so uh, high schooly, you know. But it was high schooly. It was all high school age group, mm -hmm. and they were older than me, you know. So what age did you go in then? I don't know. I was younger, mm -hmm. but I was doing high school education work, so. But it was real high schooly. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had anyone describe it as high schooly to me, even though I, 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 I think the way people talk about it, it, it seems that way. But that's funny to have it, like that description put on it, because the, the idea that you go there to live, right? And there's always this discussion about how everyone like how they manage that many kids living in one place, all these teenagers, right, in one isolated sort of place. And the rules that yeah. had to be in place just to keep everyone just moving forward. Yeah. But you don't always think about the fact that there's still a high school vibe, right? Like right. You're still. Oh yeah, and it, it was a lot of fun. It was it was a blast. I mean, you met people from all over the United States. You know, mm -hmm. that came there, and all the students were there. I mean, it was full. It was a full campus. It was it was really a lot of fun. What was fun about it? Just, I don't know, everything. <laughs> <laughs> I really liked it. Did you do any trade classes or did you mainly do like... I did printing. You did printing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I did a printing class, so I enjoyed it. Neat. Um, and I think that was after the fact, after the time when they had instituted the year-round program option. Did you do the year-round? No. Where did you go in the summers then? Um, a lot of summers I came to Clinton to my grandparents. I kind of, I kind of came home and stayed there. Mm -hmm. um, was that your choice? Did you ever think about staying or did you just always think maybe it was time to come home? What was well, I would come home and stay and then, then I was adopted by uh, George Carlson, who was a, he was a Ponca. 
minister. Mm -hmm. And his daughter was started taking me home with her all the time. From Shalaka? From Shalaka on the weekends, and they lived at White Eagle. Mm -hmm. And he worked there on the campus. And uh, him and his family took me in, and I kind of ended up kind of staying there. You know, and then he just adopted me into their family. And then he had ministered out here and had been, lived among my people out here. Mm -hmm. So he knew a lot of our traditions and a lot of our ways and stuff. So, and he would sit and talk to me for hours on end. He was just truly a great man, a wonderful mentor and a great teacher. And I really loved him. Yeah, I, what did he teach while he was in Sh you were in Chilaco? Because it sounds like you got to know him because maybe your relationship with his daughter, but yeah. he was on campus as well. Yeah, he didn't work like a teacher. I, I don't really remember what he did, honestly. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was my assumption. I just know he was there. He yeah. worked there. Yeah. Um, did he do any of the, the religious activities on campus? Because they had some churches, ch churches that would come out. I don't know. You don't know? I didn't. I don't know. What did he, um, what denomination did he preach in? Do you remember that? I don't remember that either. Also not important, just curious. No, I don't remember that either. Um, how old were you whenever you were adopted by, by him and his family? Fifteen. You were fifteen. Mm -hmm. So it was your second year in maybe? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Second year in Chilaco. Um, so do you, did you sort of consider that home after? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He had a lot of kids. Really? Oh yeah. He had a lot of kids. I mean, there were a lot of kids in that house. Were they kids like you that he had pulled together as a family or were they biological children? Most of them were biological. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I learned how to cook. <laughs> I learned how to mop, <laughs> things I did not know how to do, you know. I just didn't know how to do all that stuff. <laughs> did you not have to learn how to do some of that at Shalako too? Not really. Really? You didn't have to do a lot of chores by that point? No. That's interesting. Why would I? I was probably one of the youngest ones on campus. <laughs> no, I've heard there wasn't a lot of uh, Discrimination amongst who was uh, given given different duties at different times, but <laughs> um, so it sounds like you actually gained your life skills once you yeah. were integrated with that family. I gained a lot. Yeah. Yeah. They um, joking, laughing. Um, I'm pretty serious <laughs> so it's it's really hard for me to do the joking thing you know and Indian people joke a lot and they tease hard and um, it took me a long time to figure it out you know mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the humor because, I mean, I wasn't raised that way when I was little. There was no laughter, no fun, no joking. It was just constant bickering and arguing and fussing and fighting. And I didn't know how to laugh, so I learned how to laugh. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that's a big thing. That's a very big thing. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll come back to laughter later. We can do that. Um, okay. So, you um, were in the National Guard unit in Clinton, but that would have also been the time period while you were at Shilako, right? No. No. I graduated. Oh, it was after you graduated? Yeah, after graduation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, when you went through Shilako, I let me just ask a couple of technical questions about that. Um, like what 
what home were you in? Do you remember like I was in dorm five. The girls' dorm. Hello. Right. I can remember. I can never remember like at what point they split up ages and what happened. Well, there was only one girls' dorm. By that point, there was only one girls' dorm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that was a girls' dorm. For but they too. split. They split sides. They split levels. Right. Yeah. So were you around other like? Because your age, or, or how are you divided up? I don't know. I was, I don't know. No? I just hang out with whoever I wanted to. <laughs> was it hard to adjust once you got to campus? No. Really? Really. Yeah. Really. I loved it. I hang out with all kinds of people. And loved it. Yeah. The time didn't matter. Um, besides doing uh, the print program there, were there other things that you remember doing or other skills or classes that you particularly liked? I loved the library. They had an outstanding library on Native American history. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it was outstanding. I'd probably read every book in there. Yeah. Had you ever spent a lot of time around a lot of uh, Native people by that point? Because I know... Not really. Really? Yeah, not really. Just the ones like at um, Concho and... Just when you were younger, for yeah. periods of time? Yeah. I mean. <laughs> it was hard, you know, because it was just like... Nobody took the time to really invest in me. I see. Do you feel like people invested in you when you were in Shalaka? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I do. I had a lot of friends that invested in me, and, and George invested in me. Mm -hmm. A lot. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you found your place there. Okay, so when you graduated, um, talk to me about joining the Guard and talk to me about. Um, How you ended up doing that in, in the Clinton area? Um, well, I decided I was going to go to the, to the Guard because um, I thought, well, I'm not going to just go to the Army. I want to check it out first. Mm -hmm. See if I like it. Right. Or if I, you know, I didn't want to dive head first. <laughs> you know, as they say. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so I went ahead and I joined you. So you just graduated from Shalako and you decided to join the National Guard in Clinton partly because you wanted to test the waters before you dove headfirst into straight going into the Army. Yeah. So, um, so you joined, you, you went directly, why did you decide to, direct, to go directly from graduation to the Army, I mean to the National Guard? Um, did you think at all about maybe leaving there and just going to work or were you just like the the plan was always like after this I'm gonna Yeah, the plan was always military. Military. Okay. Yeah. Alright, so talk to me about um about joining the guard then. It's what I wanted to do, so that's what I went and done. So you I went and signed up and then you I went and signed up and um went to basic in October. Mm hmm Um Where'd you go to basic training? Sorry. Fort Jackson. Fort Jackson. Okay. okay. So you joined? Mm hmm Tell me about being in the guard then. So I was in the guard for seventy eight, seventy nine. And then in 79, I had joined the Army. And I ended up at Fort Seal, heavy artillery. Lovely, just lovely. <laughs> Join the Army, see the world. And at Fort, Fort Seal, Oklahoma, yeah. Um. <coughs> 
So when you were in the guard, uh, at what point did you, like, what got you to the point you think, okay, I've tested the water, now I'm ready to go in? I don't know. I think it was when I came back home. You know, we went to camp, Fort Chaffee. Um, from Fort Chaffee, I went to Vegas to a uh, colonel's retirement. I was in color guard there. And uh, I thought, this is exciting. So I think I'll go ahead and join the Army. Mm -hmm. So I did. So you were. What was what was exciting about that it, point? Just being out away from Oklahoma, being away from home, being away from, you know, just being away. Mm -hmm. Always something new, something different. Got it. Okay. So when you joined the Army and then you got sent to Fort Sill, um, I was not happy. <laughs> I wasn't happy about that. Was there any time when you could have requested to be stationed somewhere else? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Okay. My, um, at the end of basic, whenever I was in the guard, December 14th, 1978. That's whenever I was raped. When you were in the guard? Mm -hmm. at, at basic training at Fort Jackson. Oh gosh, right when you first went in. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, you know, I don't know. When you're, when you're, when you deal with historical trauma and then you deal with all the other trauma that, on top of that, the personal trauma and the abandonment and you deal with all this other stuff on top of that, you know, and then you deal with the moral injury. Mm -hmm that you have to endure in the military. It's, it didn't, it was something that was common. Uh, Does that make sense? Like common for you or common in? Common for me. It same. was common for me. So it was okay. To feel assaulted? Yes. And it was okay for somebody to tell me, well, you know, it didn't happen. Let me explain that to me. Did you did you, did you officially report? Like, what was your process? When when it happened, I was walking. And we had I don't know however many hours of leave or whatever that afternoon, and uh, I was walking on the sidewalk, and uh, and I should have took the bus, I know. But Were you off base? No. Were you, you were on base. base? Okay. But I mean, you know, I mean, I was just walking. I mean, what's going to happen to you on base while well, you're walking in broad daylight? But, uh, you know, so he said, come here. I turned around and looked. And about that time, he pulled me. And when he pulled me off the sidewalk, he pulled me off into the bushes there. And, I could hear other people laughing and stuff. And I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't understand it. I, I didn't know. And by the time he got done, there was another person that came and pulled him off of me and pulled me up and was helping me get my clothes straightened up and get me back to the sidewalk to safety. 
And I know who both individuals are. Mm -hmm. They were from my company. I remember them. You know, I had to hear this man's voice every day. I had to see his face every day. Did you report it? Yes. Captain Bethias, it, it didn't happen. So it just didn't happen. Drill Sergeant McBee said it didn't happen, so it just didn't happen. But the guy that pulled him off of me knew it happened, and the guy that done it knew it happened. So did the person that helped, the, it seemed like you, I don't know, maybe helping isn't actually what happened, but the person that pulled him off and helped straighten you up. He tried to speak up for me. And he got punished, like I did. We ended up pulling KP for about a week. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I still to this day can't figure that out. Do you think and I know I'm asking you to speculate, but do you get the sense that it had something to do with the other individual's relationship with people, or was it because they didn't, there, there was a, a denial culture of any sort of sexual assault that could happen? It was a denial culture. The military was not about to admit to something like that, mm -hmm. and they did not want to investigate it, and they didn't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It did not happen. It did not happen, period. That was just the way it was. So, after that, you know, I mean, it's just not, it's not been good. I drank most of the time that I was in the, in the Army. Mm -hmm. um, since then, I've put myself in other situations to be harmed. Um, I've chosen some of the worst men. My first husband locked me in the basement for two years and beat me, mm -hmm. tortured me. Um, and I thought it was fine. I don't know why I thought it was fine. Why did I think it was fine? Was it because it didn't happen? Or was it because that's just the kind of thing that, or concept that I had that I deserved? that I deserved it, that, that, or that's what maybe all I was ever going to get. With that being the starting point for your military career, how easy was it for you to, to continue on in the military? Because was that it a was pretty rough. So what was the choice? Because um, when you you talked about the different places that you were able to go and you consciously decided to sign up and keep going with the Army. Yeah. Um, and I know what I can hear you saying is that this, you know, this assault is always in the background of your mind is what it sounds like. Yeah. Um, it is now. It is now. It is now. <coughs> Um, let me expand on that. Okay. When, um, after I got out of the military, finally, and I decided to, to get out, you know, of course, you know, I've been in this horrible marriage. And, uh. While you were in the military, you, you got married while you were in the military? Yes. Um. 
I'd been in this horrible marriage and it was just, oh my God. Anyway, after that, you know, and I was drinking a lot. I drank a lot. And, you know, I began that process of drinking. And then I started using meth. And uh, I'd done meth for, what, 32 years. Mm -hmm. I was an intravenous drug user. Mm -hmm. I've been clean and sober 13 years, one month, nine days today. Um, and just in the past, Five years, six years, it started coming back, pieces and pieces. And that's why it's so, I understand now what I didn't understand then, that this, this rape and this, and the moral injury that it caused me, that the military done was so pervasive over everything in my life afterwards. Mm -hmm. And all the drug addiction and going to prison, I've been to prison twice mm -hmm. um, for drugs. Um, I sold drugs, you know, I wasn't a nice person. Mm -hmm. When you were in, when you were continuing on in the military, with this denial of an assault that you had reported, um, was that, did, did you, was that behavior that you saw continued on other places? Did you see assault happen to other people or did you talk to other assault survivors at the time? Was there any points of contact you had with other people who were working through some of the same things or did you feel isolated or it's something completely outside of that? I felt pretty isolated, you know, I mean, the two guys knew what happened. Mm -hmm. I knew what happened. And I told two friends, they were sisters, that I was with in basic. I told them both what happened, because they were my best friends. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as anybody else, no. There was no one to talk to, there was no one to tell. So, you know, I just kind of ignored it, and it just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that it did happen, and it came back, and it controlled my whole life. Mm -hmm. You know, for me to allow some man into my life to touch me without cringing is... would be, I don't know, something that I wouldn't even understand. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even begin to understand. You know, I'm compulsed by the idea of somebody touching me. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to have physical contact with people, period. Those babies, maybe. You know, I try to do that a lot with them because I know I'm not built that way. Because of that, because mm -hmm. of this, it's controlled my life. Mm -hmm. And I try to take back over and take that power back and and it's like I have to I have to force myself to do it. I have to force myself to hug my babies and, and to hug my grandchildren and and I have to force myself to tell people that I love them. And I shouldn't have to do that. Right. But this is what this has stolen from me. I'm 58 years old. This has stolen my life from me. It's stolen the fact that I, I will never have a, a real relationship with a human being, a man. I could never have a marriage. There's no way in hell I want anybody in my bed. Are you kidding me? I'm like, uh, what do you, what? What do you, you want what? You want me to do what? No. So this is an interesting thing, too, because it seems like there's been more public recognition of the assault culture that, that has happened and been covered up in, in the military. In the last couple of years, you see more publicly 
um, sort of recognition that there has been this happening, right? That, yeah. that there's assault that happens and then there's an assault that's been covered up pervasively. Um, have you thought much, has that sort of come out more publicly? Has, has that made an impact on any of the way that you're able to process this? Is that... I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just know that... I just know that... You know, for the past 13 years, you know, I mean, I'm, I've been in therapy, I go to... You know, I go to a doctor, or I, you know, I mean, it's just... Yeah. So are you getting any help from the VA at this yes, point? Yes, I have, yeah. I get full compensation. I'm 100% disabi disability for MST and PTSD. And so is the PTSD related to this directly? Yes. So they've acknowledged it after the fact? Yes. At what point were you able to make that claim that was accepted? Um, it's probably been about two years ago. So very recently. But that doesn't mean that the nightmare stopped. Of course not, no. Just because you say something doesn't make it go away. And just because you finally admit to something doesn't mean that that's going to fix 30-something years of damage that was, you know. I'm it, just... It's just not... It's. No, it doesn't. It doesn't compensate. And I'm not, I, and you can't put a dollar on, no. it can't put a dollar on my life. It's ruined my life, my entire adulthood. Um, any opportunity for me to have a normal life is gone. Mm -hmm. I'm too old to start to have a normal life now. I'm too old to have a relationship with a man. But I don't think it fixes that at all. No. I, I'm... I mean, I, I, but you understand what I'm saying. I do, yeah. I, I'm, I'm interested in the fact, too, that the, the VA... Um, it sounds like there have been some changes at some point to be able to have a place for you to come and say, I'm gonna make this claim again, and and for them to acknowledge it, and, and there to be a structure for some sort of... This is it. Assistance, but it's just basically... This is okay. it, me and you, right now, this is it. This place to make, be able to publicly say. This is it. This was the first step. Mm -hmm. This was the book. This is the Volunteers of America. Talk to me about that, because that's where our first point of engagement for yeah. you and I was. This was the momentum of hope. Mm -hmm. um, the Volunteers of America, uh, Ms. Cottrell, and several people approached me at a Volunteers of America meeting class at OSU in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we were talking about moral. We were talking. No, we were talking about historical trauma. Right. And uh, of course, you know, the, they knew that I was a veteran because I was there. And uh, she wanted to know a little bit about my story, so I just kind of glazed over it or whatever. And then she asked me if I would write her a short story. Yeah. So I did. Based on your experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway. <laughs> They ended up publishing it and uh, printing it, and it's in that book. And um, I just went the other couple weeks ago to Washington, D.C., so now it's in print. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first time I've talked about it verbally. Right. I'm a very good writer, but... It's different. So it's different talking about it. So when you and I sat down, um, one of the things uh, that you explained to me, and maybe you can explain it again, was why this is important to you. And I'm and, and I'm talking about the points of the feeling that the 
military let you down, but also the fact that you're proud to have served in the military. Yes. So maybe, how does that work? I don't know, it just does. I am a strange person. <laughs> I don't think that's probably strange at all. Well, maybe it's but not. But it's complicated. It's very complicated. I'm a complicated person. That's what the word is. I'm I would totally person. agree. <clears throat> um, I'm proud to have served in the Army. I'm proud to have served in the military. I'm proud that I'm, I'm a veteran. I'm very proud of that fact. I mean, it just... I'm honored. Not everybody takes that as something. You know, my dad was in the Navy. And uh, my adoptive father was in the military, George. And uh, my uh, my grandmother's brother, G.W. Moxley, who was missing in action for many years. You know, he was he was the one that was the he was a uh, fighter pilot in World War II. And uh, the more I found out about him and stuff, they got his name on a on a wall in Camden, England somewhere, mm -hmm. um, that I'd love to see. I mean, none of our family has ever seen it, ever, ever. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of curious as to why it's over there instead of here, but nonetheless, I mean, I would still love to see it. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't know why I, I feel like it, you know, it's just being in the military is a, is a, is a great honor, you know. They, you know, Native American Indian people. I mean, this was this was our our country long before it was anybody else's, and I would die for it. I would die die defending it. I would die defending it today, and I would defend my children and my grandchildren. I would give my life for them. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't I be honored to be in the military? That's my question. Yeah. You know? So a lot of it is, well, you just described it. But I think that what I what I hear from you too is that wrestling between feeling like personally you were let down by the system of it while feeling and understanding and believing in the core principle of what its function is, right? So I felt like Yeah. I felt like I was very, on a personal level, but when you're talking about the military, you're talking about the military. Right. You're not talking about a corporation even. You're talking about the military. Yeah. So were you in Fort Sill the entire time that you were in the Army then? Yeah. Until you, what was it, 82? Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think there's enough women or even men that have come forward. I don't think there's enough people that have talked about it. In fact, that's the reason why I'm talking to you. You mean about assault? About the assault, about the rape. Yeah. You know, and, and you say assault, I say rape. You know, and I understand that you say assault because it's probably a better, a nicer term. I'm saying rape. Right, I understand. So. <clears throat> so, how, how common do you think that that was when you were in the military? I think it was really common. What gives you that sense? Now, now that I'm older, now that I'm clean and my mind is clean, and now that I can actually see and I can process, 
the process and I can see the process in other people. Mm -hmm. I can recognize it. I can recognize the behaviors. I can recognize the defenses. I can recognize what they're going through. Mm -hmm. um, I know that whenever I went to go to an MST group in Oklahoma City at the VA, there was two women there and one of them wasn't, had never been in the military. And the other one, I don't know where she came from. It was just like, I'm a little fruity and flaky and weird and strange and all that good stuff. But this, this young lady was just really, it wasn't, I couldn't relate to this group. Mm -hmm. Of two women, two other women. It was just the that MST group was just made up of two other women. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It just wasn't. Is that the only group that's like that within a driving range of you? Yeah. So. I don't, but I know that it's happened to other people. And. Uh, I have identified at least one tribal member, a female, in the military that it's happened to. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not the only one. I know that. And if nothing else, at least, I hope that somebody will find will find their story and be able to tell their story. And that's all I want. You mean that by hearing that it happened to you that someone else will feel that they can speak up about? Yeah, of course. Whether it, that it's happened to them? Yes, of course. I can't get anything. I mean, I can't get anything back. There's nothing. There's no way. I can't get anything back. They've already admitted to it. They give me a check every month. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, I was scared to death to say anything because I was afraid they were gonna send somebody to kill me. What did make you decide to break your silence on that again? Like, what, at what point, and, and maybe, maybe explain a little bit about how that happened and that also might be a little barrier breaking because if you had that fear you know other people have that fear I was terrified so what made you what made you speak up and who who did you do it to how did you how did it happen I was just scared all the time you think it was rational fear I felt like it was at the time was this after you had become sober at that point, or was this still while you after I come, after became you sober? sober? Yeah. So, so if you were terrified all the time, how did you move from feeling terrified? I thought I was crazy. From feeling crazy to where you are now, which is having acknowledgement from the military and sounds like counseling and things like that. Yeah. So, how did you get from that point to this point? Because I will, I. It's just a process. It's a long process. It's been a long, long process. Did someone convince you to go and talk to somebody? Did you file an official claim? Did you go in and talk to somebody? What What, what happened? I um. Well, what are they going to do? You finally got to the point where you felt. I was tired of being afraid. Mm -hmm. And even at that point, I was afraid. Even after I filed the claim, I was afraid. Mm -hmm. I was scared. I was scared they were going to come after me. And I was scared they was going to harm my grandchildren. Or they was going to find out where I lived. Of course they was going to find out where I lived. It was in writing, mm -hmm. you know. This would have been just a few years ago, right? Yeah. Like two or three, three but years I, ago. But I was tired of being afraid. You could only live in fear for so long. I mean, come on, 30-something years, that's long enough. 
So that pushed you to the edge to put in a file, a, a claim with the VA? Yes. Yes. How long did it take to work through the process with that? Not long. Really? Yeah. So what was the process for them to verify, or did they have any verification? What? They did something. I don't know what they did. And it didn't take them very long. So that you basically, your, your part of this was you put in a written claim, mm -hmm. and they came back and said, accepted, and moved on. Is that what happened? Yeah. Yep. So if somebody else is in a similar position as you, they're harboring this past. Don't be afraid. They can't eat you and they can't take away your birthday. I mean, what are they going to do? Cut short me in life. <laughs> I mean, come on. At this point in time in my life, the only thing I'm afraid of is not being around long enough to finish raising these two. And they're almost grown. I've got them halfway raised, you know? So, here on out, it's just gravy and icing. I don't care. So, it seems like whenever possible now, you still work with veterans. Has that been something you've done for a long time or is that something you've recently re-engaged with? Well, it's something that I've just started doing because of my job. Mm -hmm. um, I work for the Shawnee Rapo Tribe. I'm a resource manager. I work for the I answer to the governor only. However, I work for the people. I work for the Shiner Repo people. How long have you been doing that? Three years. <coughs> Before, I was working for the people in C3, which is a district area, mm -hmm. a specific area. But now I work for you know, I cover the nine counties. And uh, it's like almost 12,000 people. Is that the entirety of the Cheyenne Arapaho yes. population then? Yes. Yes. So, and that's for every program, which includes the veterans program. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't, I can't go in there and switch things up or go, you know, I don't do that. But what I do is I go to the veteran themselves and I go to their home and I, and I find out what they need. I do an assessment. I uh, see if I can put them in touch with uh, somebody from the VA or if I can get them their benefits or if I can, you know, seek somebody else out for them to, to come and see them or send somebody to them. Mm -hmm. That's what I do is I kind of bridge that gap. I don't do the actual paperwork or anything, but I bridged the gap. Right. Because most of them know me. How do they know you? Because I'm, I'm a tribal member and I work here and, and I'm in the community. I do a lot of community outreach with everybody. I do it, you know, through housing. I do it through, I, I help people with anything and everything that they need. Mm -hmm. Different families, I don't care who they are. I mean, I go to their homes. I go to courts, you know, to hearings with people, you know, when they're going to lose their children. I go to, you know, I help them into treatment. I take people to treatment when they need to go to treatment. I'm a recovering addict. That's part of my job. That's, that's what I do. My position is a heart position. It's not something that you just do and let it go and go home. You know, I'm on call 24 hours a day because people have needs 24 hours a day. So, you know, that's what I'm there for, is I'm there for them to call me so that I can go and I can get other places to help them, whether it's tribal, state, city, you know, churches in their community, federal, yeah. military, so, on that note, when I find another individual that has been 
sexually assaulted, raped, whatever, in the military, you know, I strongly suggest that they go tell somebody. Mm -hmm. And there's contact information. I've got contact information. I can't make them. And if they're not ready, they're just not ready. Look how long it took me to get ready. Was there anybody in your life that you remembered help, tried to push you in that direction at any point? No. 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 I just, I just had to get ready. And I had to go through the whole scenic route to suicide to get there. And that's what I call drug addiction and alcoholism is a scenic route to suicide, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what it is. Of course, you couldn't have told me, you know, 20 years ago that that's why I was getting high. Because something that happened to me in the military, I'd have laughed at you. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. You have no idea. Why do you think that? Because I was high. And I didn't care what you had to say. You weren't looking for a correlation? No. Is that what it is? No. Yeah. Huh. Are you kidding? In a relationship? No. Right. So I don't I don't think you've said yet, but what was your what was your decision to leave the military in, in eighty two? Like why'd you choose to get out? I was dead. I was just dead. I was done. Was it because you had enough time in it? Was it because of all, uh, you had picked up all this baggage and other things in your I life? I just couldn't look at another fatigue. I couldn't look at another, I couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't do it anymore. I just started wearing these shirts recently. Really? Like in the last year. Because mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. me around it. I couldn't help. I hated the color green. Except on money, of course. <laughs> and it all stems back to your rape in 1978, you think? Yeah. 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 So, bringing this back to a, a a roundabout question I had earlier that it seems like maybe that the culture has shifted at least from the outside for being able to report sexual trauma, rape, assault, whatever within the military ranks. Do you know, do you feel that that is true? Do you have any way to know if that maybe I don't think it's true. true. I don't think it's true. I don't believe that, not for a minute. Just you don't think culture would be able to change that much within the military? No. no. It's too male oriented. Um, when they go through the don't ask, don't tell, and all that crap. And I, I just, I'm not buying it. Okay? I'm not buying it because I know how hard it is and I know how they are and I know how the military operates. Mm -hmm. It's one way or the other, period. It doesn't, there's no in between, there's no gray area. You're either a soldier or you're not. So what do you tell women when you talk to them who want to join the military? Or do you? I don't. I don't advocate for the military. So if someone comes to you and says, I am thinking about joining the military and this is what I, my plan is, do you, do you just ignore the fact that, like, you know, it seems to me like you I'm are like, a very okay. vocal person, so. I'm like, okay. But you don't stop and say, mm -hmm. here's yeah. some things to look out for, or no. No. I just tell them, be careful, because you know what? I join the military to see the world, and I end up at Fort Seal. <laughs> and I say it in a joking manner, so. Sure. But that doesn't, 
I don't say anything else, you know, as far as that goes. Right. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say, hey, be careful, you're going to go get raped. I wouldn't say that to anybody. Well, I wouldn't, right. I wouldn't think that anyway. But sometimes people, I don't know, sometimes people have, I, I don't know what I was asking. I, I kind of know what I was asking for that, but it's, it's more an issue of. You know how many times I've been to the base with this? No. Twice. Oh, really? Since you've had your ID? Since you've been out, you mean? Well, since I've gotten this ID. Oh, yeah? Yeah? Twice. And? Two times. And every time I go there, I think, and I look at these women, every time, and I think, I wonder if she's okay. Mm -hmm. I wonder if she's okay. Is she going to be okay? Is that little girl going to be okay until she gets back home? What do you think the answer is? What's the solution to this problem? In a great, wonderful world, the solution would be for you know, each military base to have its own, its own counselors, its own uh, unit, uh, therapy units, to have its own places for women to go so that they would feel comfortable, or, you know, even men, mm -hmm. to feel comfortable enough to talk about assault. You don't have to worry about repercussions. You don't have to worry about, you know, being victimized all over again so that they can start to work on processing it before they get out, before it ruins their life. Mm -hmm. That's a perfect world. That'd be a perfect world. But you and I both know that's not going to happen. But I, I've never heard of a, a, a military base having somebody go in there and talk to the people. Mm. Go in there and talk to the women. Go and talk to the men. Mm. I've never heard of that. But I think that would be a good, a good thing. Mm -hmm. It, w it couldn't hurt. That is definitely a yes, it could not hurt. Right. And it wouldn't cost anything. An hour of somebody's time. Mm -hmm. So where are you going to go from here with all of this? Whatever is put in front of me. That's kind of what I do. Whatever's put in front of me is what I do. I deal with that one day at a time. And then uh, something always happens. You know, there's always something really awesome that comes along. And uh, that's what, whatever's there is what I do. Mm -hmm. Whoever comes in front of me, I help. Whatever needs to be done in front of me, I do. Mm -hmm. And it's all I can do. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it gets to be way too much. It's, my job gets to be too much. <laughs> I understand that you're on call 24-7. Yeah. As far as helping other people solve problems. Yeah. What was the thing that why did you end up getting clean after all that time? I, uh, the first man that I married was malicious, cruel, mm -hmm. and 
of course it didn't happen. Um, he, oh my God, he just beat me so bad all the time. It was terrible. Um, he psychologically and physically raped my daughter. My daughter, his daughter, our daughter. <coughs> and uh, when he did that, I knew that she was going to need me. And uh, I vowed to, to clean up so that I could be there for her. And of course, I didn't realize that, that cleaning up was going to take me all this time. But I am there for her. And, you know, I know that I wasn't a good mother. I've got three daughters. I wasn't a good mother. I know that. And I'm okay with that. I've forgiven myself for that. But I'm an awesome grandmother. I am outstanding. And I love it. There's nothing better. Yeah. Well, is there anything that you wanted to cover that we didn't get to cover? Is there anything you want to talk about that we didn't get a chance to talk about? I think we talked about just about everything. I just want, you know, I just want someone to know that they're not alone. Yeah. And don't be afraid. You know, go tell somebody and talk to somebody. Yeah. Don't let it take over your life. That's it. Take your life back. Take your life back. I think it is a really important thing to be able to see you succeeding after struggling for so long because it's very obvious that you're succeeding in life. I, I feel like that I'm blessed. And I feel like these are, everything that happens to me every day is just grace. Yeah. This is nothing, I don't deserve any of this. None of it. But you know what? This is, this is not, this is not my movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not my play. It's not my book. It's the creator's. It's my hips. So I just have to do and go along, like I said, and do what's in front of me mm -hmm. and help just that one person. And when I help that one person, then I feel okay. I, I still don't sleep very much at night, but at least if I help that one person, I can sleep a couple of hours. But my heart can rest. Yeah. You know? And that's all I want is just be able to you know, have some peace of mind. Yeah. And not hurt anybody else in the process. Well, it seems like you're reconnecting to where you need to reconnect personally as well. So. Yeah. It's a process. It's a long process. It's called life. It's called life. Yeah. Life on nice terms. <laughs>